Okay, so um, today we are going to explore why the so-called war on drugs is a barrier to locally led adaptation and climate justice. And we are gonna have a look at how regulation could be a solution um, to mitigating some of these barriers and some of these risks that, that we're facing with, with this illicit drugs trade. So um, while um, I'm gonna introduce the, the session to you, what I'd love to invite you all just to put your cameras on, introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, maybe your name, your organization. And if you feel like it, perhaps writing why drugs and um, drug policy, climate justice is of interest um, to you and to your organization. Um, we only have two participants, so we should maybe call out Aki and Teresa by name. Oh, great. Hi, Aki and Teresa. Okay, great. So I'm just sort of seeing who I've got in the room. Okay, so let's let me introduce myself and Patricia. Um, so um, uh, next slide, please, uh, Sam. Um, so Patricia um, Chalva is the founder and executive director on, of Fundación Acción Semila, not-for-profit organization that specializes in drug policy, human rights, um, and the coca leaf in Bolivia. And my name is Clemmy James. I'm the drug policy lead and campaigner at Health Poverty Action. Um, and the way we're going to do this session, we might we might sort of um, adapt it a little bit, um, depending on how many we are. Um, but I'm going to give a little overview on um, the history of drug policy and how it impacts people and the planet at the moment. Um, then we were going to do a ja an interactive jam board um, to look at drug policy um, in your own countries and um, maybe drug policies that you have heard about or have personally um, been impacted by. Um, then we'll do a second jam board looking at how drug policies are impacting the most vulnerable in your communities. Then we will have a presentation by Patricia on um, um, regulation of the coca leaf in Bolivia and the journey towards regulation. And then I will conclude the session by looking at reforms that are happening around the world and how legal regulation could play a role in strengthening sustainable development and climate justice. So um, let's begin. Um, I will just give you a little history of um, drug policy. Um, and um, I'm gonna take us right back to the sort of, sort of the basics and just assume that we're all sort of starting and, and forgive me if you know quite a lot about drug policy, but sometimes it's helpful just to go back and, and really describe what we, what we mean by this. So um, global drug policy um, has been dominated by Prohibition, and sometimes they, these two words sort of in, in you know mean the same thing. Global drug policy, prohibition, and um, essentially that means the global prohibition of growing, producing, moving, and consuming drugs. Um, and this is globally known as the war on drugs. Um, and when we talk about drugs. Um, in health poverty action and with a lot of Patricia's work, we often talk about plant-based illicit drugs, coca leaf, cannabis and opium. But of course, there are many, many um, synthetic drugs that are also illegal. Um, and um, all of these illegal drugs are classed in different levels and, and um, the, sort of the sort of punitive response to uh, producing or consuming depends um, on what class that drug is. Um, but it's probably safe to say that the dominant world response is criminalization of illegal drugs. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the war on drugs is indeed 
enshrined by you the UN so while many of us understand that the UN is sort of um, the body of um, protecting and safeguarding human rights and sustainable development around the world. It also has a um, body that looks at crime and security. And that, um, that entity has three conventions on prohibition. Um, and so the UN is over, like underwriting and, and overseeing and enforcing prohibition around the world. Unfortunately, the aim of the global uh, on, on um, global drug policy um, has um, been the opposite. And so, in fact, it has failed in its own terms. So, so the UN's tagline um, or, yeah, has been a world, a drug free world for the last 60 years. Um, it couldn't be further from the truth. So growing, producing, and moving, consuming of drugs has only increased in the last 60 years. More than a quarter of a billion people use drugs every year. Um, and a record number of drug related deaths um, are happening each year. And that, that um, is, is rising. So trying to combat drug taking and, and, and producing um, with criminalization has proven to be in fact a war on people and the environment and we'll, ex we'll explore why um, as we go through this session. Uh, next slide please. Um, oh I think we missed one. E yeah okay so prohibition um, I'll go back one, sorry Sam, thank you. <laughs> Prohibition has been, um, its, it's, it's legacy is in neo-colonial, neo uh, yeah, um, uh, neoliberal doctrine that has been just sort of designed in the United States um, and has been pushed around the world, enshrined by the UN law, and has been a successful tool of control and oppression by governments, in particular for certain groups of people. So different, different drugs perceived to be taken by different groups of people, and those groups have been targeted, resulting in policing, criminalizing, and mass incarceration that is disproportionate in both scale and approach towards communities of color, indigenous people, and marginalized groups. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just for a moment, I just want us to think about things that have been deemed perhaps from a moralistic perspective or a religious perspective um, at a certain point in history has been deemed um, wrong and has been made illegal. Um, often that has rarely got rid of the service or the product. In fact, what that's done is that's pushed the trade underground. Um, and uh, just an, an, another example is um, a, a abortion services. So making abortion services illegal did not and has not ever got rid of um, people trying to access abortions. In fact, what it's done is it's made abortions um, deeply um, dangerous for women, um, shrouded in stigma, um, and um, it it but it has not made them go away. This is the same thing that's happened with drugs. So while prohibiting it has made it go underground, and what that has meant, next slide please, is that it has created a multi-billion dollar trade, approximately worth $650 billion a year. That makes it approximately the fifth largest trade in the world. This is an unregulated, untaxed and profit-driven trade. Um, there are no mechanisms currently along the supply chain to prevent violence, exploitation, corruption, extortion and harm. And that is like I've just said, along the supply chain, but also from a consuming perspective. So wherever you are in the world, it is rare that you are legally allowed to test what you're consuming, um, that people who grow and move drugs are not able to um, have labor rights, um, organize themselves. Um, they are at the mercy of groups that use um, 
due to the risk of criminalization, they use methods um, that um, ca cause extreme harm and, 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 um, and that is unaccountable and, and unmeasured um, around the world. Uh, next slide, please. So organized crime groups control the market. Um, companies don't control the market um, and governments don't control the market. These huge profits um, bribe, intimidate and control public institutions um, such as the police, border security and um, ju uh, judiciaries as well as whole governments to maintain their share, oh, spelling mistake, apologies, of the profit leading to corruption and weak governance um, and a lack of public resources and, and, and finances. Um, next slide, please. So prohibition um, is a driver of poverty and inequality and is a barrier to social justice. It threatens gender justice, undermines democracies, undermines public services, destroys livelihoods, stops people accessing essential health care, criminalizes poor and marginalized communities, creates years of stigmatization and shame, causes institutional racism and diverts money away from sustainable development. Um, as countries begin to prepare for the climate emergency, we at Health Poverty Action and Samila and other organizations around the world are beginning to be deeply concerned about the role the drugs trade will play and is playing in enabling communities um, to prepare and, um, and mitigate um, the ongoing climate crisis. Um, and we, um, everyone in, in this space will understand that to, to prepare and, and be ready um, to roll out adaptation plans and strategies and change, we need governance, whether that's locally led governance, community led governance, indigenous governance, or, or state led governance, we need a mutual responsive um, relationship between people and leadership that is trusting and prepared to change and prepared to adapt. Um, and I've written here, accountable, transparent, democratic, financially stable forms of governance to deliver climate mitigation and adaptation and justice. Our concern is that while there is this multi-billion dollar industry that is underscoring this landscape of needing to safeguard and protect and prepare um, the um, for climate change. Um, are we going to be able to do this while um, this trade it currently exists and um, is very much um, an intersection between drug policy and climate change that is overlooked and um, not named um, as something that needs to be reformed to be able to um, deliver the, the climate requirements. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, and um, it, it, the, 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 I'm sure many of you know this, that that's the um, planet's largest carbon sinks um, that are key to our climate future um, follow the equator. Uh, these are the jungles of Southeast Asia, West Africa, and the forests of Central and South America. And these equatorial landscapes are also the world's trafficking route of the illicit drugs trade. So like I've just said, governments don't manage these landscapes, these forests, organized crime does. And the profits that are made by organized crime from the illicit drugs trade is poured into corrupting um, public institutions to maintain the status quo, but also money is laundered into other deeply destructive forms of um, uh, farming, cattle farming, mining and illegal logging that is destroying large parts of our planet. Um, and so there is the immediate and then the wider consequences of this illicit drugs trade. Um, so there's two things really, there's the, the impacts of the trade itself, um, and then there's the um, 
controlling and um, fighting the war on drugs. So the amount of money that goes into fighting the war on drugs, the amount of money that goes into aerial spraying and destroying large parts of landscapes and, and land to, to, um, to eliminate crops. Um, we are trapped into a cycle of environmental harm simply by prohibiting these plants. We have created a ticking time bomb. Next slide, please. Okay, so the good news um, is that um, change is starting to happen and countries around the world have realized that um, we have been harming communities and we are harming our planet by prohibiting um, a trade that it's proven that people will continue to need and to use drugs, whether it's for recreational purposes or cultural and spiritual purposes, um, or indeed um, medicinal purposes. People do use drugs and we need to find ways of mitigating the harm of prohibition. Um, so these are some of the examples that are happening around the world, harm reduction, diversion, through harm reduction, just to give you a quick understanding of harm reduction, harm reduction um, would be like being able to um, take drugs in safe spaces, um, uh, take home methadone, so, um, safe syringe spaces, being able to test your ecstasy before you go dancing, being able to be informed about what you're consuming. Um, harm reduction could also look like um, environmental regulations that are imposed on the supply chain. Um, diversion is instead of criminalizing people, diverting them to public health support. Um, decriminalization is um, not criminalizing people who consume, um, produce or move drugs. And legal regulation would be all of the above, plus making the trade, bringing the trade, transferring the trade from the illegal to the legal market, which would mean that they, the that um, it, people would be able to have labour rights, they would be able to self-organise, they would be able to unionise, they would they would be able to um, benefit from all the. Um, the mechanisms that we have available to us um, to ensure that they are safe and they can have a thriving livelihood and that their livelihood is not at risk of destruction and they are not at risk of criminalization. Um, and these, these reforms are happening all around the world from Canada to America, South Africa, Malawi, Ghana, um, Thailand, um, Uruguay, um, Colombia has recently got a new president who is now publicly talking and addressing the UN and looking at legally regulating cocaine. Um, and now, um, very shortly after our in, in interactive um, session, we will look at um, the reforms that happened in Bolivia and the impact on the Bolivians with the coca leaf. So thank you very much. Um, for, um, for listening. Um, I hope that's given you a little whistle stops tour of sort of drug prohibition. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to um, my colleague Patricia. I'm just going to jump in, Clemmy, uh, just so you know. We had one participant, but he jumped off. I don't know whether it was a connection issue. So uh, it's just us at the moment. I'm not entirely sure uh quite how to do happens. yes i don't know whether you want to carry on i thought it was fascinating and i it's been recorded so you can keep it if you want to keep it for your own purposes but we don't really have much of a discussion at the moment um why don't so we go on to, why don't we just go on to patricia's um presentation then okay and then you'll have the recording and you can use it and edit it down as you as you yeah want. And, and I think it I think it is a really interesting presentation. So maybe we just do Patricia's presentation and then wrap up. Let's do that. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. If that's okay with you, Patricia. Yeah, of course. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me share the screen.
thank you very much. Okay, all yours. Okay. Uh, well, I'm here to talk about social control and co in Bolivia. Um, I would like to start with the historic context. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Well, um, when we talk about the drug policy in Bolivia, we are talking about a political history in my country that could be not understood without the without understanding the development of its drug policies regarding uh, specifically about cocaine. Those uh, derived from repression, conflict, and vindication of this sacred land. These processes were determined by social organizations as an organized trade union force in a context in which North American policies demanded a frontal fight against the coca leaf from the state. Uh, it was between the 70s and the 90s. Next, please. So, um, in Bolivia has been a coca leaf prohibition like in the whole world. And the first antecedent in international drug laws are the single convention on narcotic drugs on 1961. Uh, it is a document that in four lists bring, be, brings together a set of easily extracted plants, substances and alkaloids. Those who use um, production are regulated by international control system. Uh, on the other side, we have the Convention of Psychotropic Substances of 1971. This convention uh, against illicit traffic in nar narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances of 1988, which in the release leave room for therape therapeutic uses of some substances, but require their prohibition for rec recreational and non-medical uses, as you can see uh, on the screen. On the next slide, we can uh, we can see that while in the 1971 convention, uh, while it speaks of the elimination of traditional cultural and ceremonial uses of coca, in 2000, 2007, 2007 uh, United Nations declaration was issued on the right of indigenous people. Although there was a first diplomatic stage for coca in Bolivia and Peru among 1988 and 1996, it was only in 2006 that the revaluation policies emerged. So we can see that in 2009, uh, we have a new political constitution of the state that contemplates that coca leaf uh, is um is a matter that the state protects as original and ancestral coca as cultural heritage um and it uh, sees it as a renewable natural resource of bolivian biodiverse diversity so in the next one please we can see that in 2013 bolivia exits the single convention of 1961 and reevaluates its readherence with the reservation of the consumption of coca leaf in its natural form. So those actions mark a milestone in international drug policy. Um, and we can see that in March, that uh, on, on 2017 March, the first coca regulation law in Bolivia and the world was approved with um, a 1,300 uh, 1, hectares for the Yungas region, that is a region located in La Paz, and 7,700 hectares for Cochabamba. Um, for the Tropic of Cochabamba. So um, going, going to the next slide, please. We can talk about a little bit about the social control, the community social control that you, it has been promoted a lot 
like an alternative to um, the fight against drugs that is commonly used around the world. This policy uh, of integral development with COCA of Bolivian State achieves productive socioeconomic programs and projects executed in those coca production regions uh, regarding to La Paz and Cochabamba. So it's important to mention that this implementation of this community social control exercised by the, is exercised by the producers themselves. So it has allowed them to be rational, rational and reasonable in the amount of coca leaf production. It is based in the framework framework of the 906 coca leaf law and well next one please we can see that in 2008 the producer of los yungas with their social organizations were direct participants in their participants in the rationalization of their crops in traditional areas meaning that the social community are Directly, directly involved into this uh, process through agreements and consensus with the producers. And in their case, uh, with the eradications of surplus crops with the agreement of both parts, meaning that the coca growers uh, work uh, with the government in this process of um, rationalization of the crops. So this agreement was signed in September of 2008. Next one, please. This agreement was signed with the support of the of program for social control of coca leaf production that was financed and signed uh, with the support of the European Commission and the government of Bolivia. So the general, the general objective was supporting the government of Bolivia in the implementation of coherent policies to fight drug trafficking under a set of um, actions carried out within the framework of a strategy to fight drug trafficking and revaluation of coca leaf. Next one, please. So the Tropic Federation guaranteed that the concept and mechanism of social control are accepted by the producers and their respective organization. The Tropic Federations are located uh, in the Cochabamba region and their mechanism were, uh, first of all, the verification and measurement that the plantations do not exceed the ex exits the coca price, uh, the social control communication and a dissemination strategy, both at the level of the organizations and also at the level of at the public opinion. Um, also, we have the capacity building of social organizations in conflict, management in the application of social control, and Finally, we have this uh, sufficient training infrastructure, infrastructure equip, equipment and technology uh, because if you don't have the, the, the training, uh, all this gets, uh, gets lack of power, right? So next one, please. The implementation of social control uh, was much more difficult to apply as a state policy in Los Yungas because they have the, their own their own um, way of community control. They have a powerful institution named Adepoca, which controls production processes and marketing from the community to the legal market and sees its interests affected by social control measures making the implementation of sectorial policies much more difficult. But uh, it shows that the social control outside Cochabamba was, uh, it, it has its limitations. So um, it's time to talk about alternative development. 
Um, well, uh, we can say that this alternative development in Bolivia was a strategy that meant alternating or substituting coca crops with agricultural tourism and craft projects that would be more profitable than the option of producing coca leaves. So for this purpose, repression and interdiction, which brought more violence and put growers at the center of the drug, drug, drug traffic uh, conflict, uh, this was kind of the, the main uh, policy before the social control was applied. Next one, please. So on the other side, we have, uh, next slide, please. So on the other side, we have this integral development with COCA that was developed uh, on, the, on the frame of the 906 law on COCA leaf. And this is the new national strategy for comprehensive sustainable de development with COCA. It was applied for Bolivian coca leaf regulation, and it explains the process by which policies are developed and implemented to replace the previous alternative development policy until 2005, and proposes the consolidation of on the lessons learned from the previous, previous two policies. Next one, please. So we can see that the National Strategy for Comprehensive Sustainable Development with COCA states that the political constitution of the state recognized the coca leaf as cultural heritage, renewable natural resource of Bolivian biodiversity, and as a factor of social cohesion. Next one, please. So, in this context, the comprehensive sustainable development strategy with COCA for the Yungas on La Paz and the Tropic of Cochabamba, it reaffirms the political will of the Bolivian state to prevent the diversion of the coca leaf towards illicit activities through control and supervision of the cultivated crops in outer illicit areas, the prevention of the cultivation in areas at risk of crop expansion, the marketing control, and well, based on these measures that fight against poverty. So it's fundamental um, for the life hope opportunities and provides to the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities and groups affected by coca crops in authorized and authorized areas. So next one, please. Integral development constitutes a policy of common and shared responsibility generated in the internal sphere, but which transcends the international sphere. So its effectiveness will depend on the institutional strengthening of the state, the strengthening of the legal framework, the participation of the local communities and social organizations, providing economic support, technical assistance, investment, and the, rec the recognition of property rights, including access to land. So um, we're going to talk about the relationship with the principles for locally led adaptation. Social control is related to uh, these principles by developing the by devolving decisions making to the lowest appropriate level, by giving local institutions and communities direct access to finance and decision making power on their own progress and evolution of the community objectives, regulating the expansion of illegal coca crops. Um, it also addresses structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, and indigenous people and ethnic groups who were completely marginalized. Uh, it also integrates gender-based economic and political inequalities that are roots uh, of the vulnerability. Um, and we can say that women role, the, the, the role of women on it is fundamental 
in the productive and market change. As we see as our leadership in the community by participating in the decision-making process during the meetings, the community meetings that they have. So um, they, 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 they get to occupy a power position as mayor or leadership positions. Finally, next one, please. Uh, no, one before. Yes, uh, yes, uh, we can see that uh, it ensures transparency and accountability and uh, uh, regards also in a making process of financing, designing and delivering programs more transparent and accountable toward the local stakeholders. So uh, the fund eight also is uh, regarded to this uh, when you talk about the collaborative action and investment. And finally, we can talk about a collaboration across sectors, initiatives and levels to ensure that different initiatives and different sources of funding, like humanitarian assistance, development, disaster risk, disaster risk reduction, green recovery funds, and so on, support one another and their activities avoid duplication to enhance efficiencies and good pra practices. Um, what is really important about this policy is uh, what is important of the regulation uh, is that uh, it helps in the development of the well being that it produces from community control of its own obje objectives. Um, it uh, regards also in the reduction of poverty, reduction of violence, and territorial and economic sovereignty. So um, regulation of coca leaf in Bolivia has uh, a really powerful uh, acceptance uh, on their communities. And I think this is a model that could be also exported and works on like a good experience for other countries related rela related to 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 a drug conflict that would be all and um, thank you very much <laughs>